I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the founder of the church I served as a bishop. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many others have made a similar journey into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about, people who want to share their story. So if you're a Latter-day Saint seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. If you'll recall last week, we uh, met Warren Puckett. Thanks again for coming and joining us. And we went through a number of topics, and it's just amazing how many topics there are, things that we just really didn't know at all in our many years of Mormonism. Warren, 43 years. I was six, <clears throat> 65 years in the church. Mm -hmm and just things that we didn't have any clue about. And so we thought it'd be interesting to cover some of these topics that actually impacted us as we started coming out of, of Mormonism. And, and we were just finishing up the Book of Commandments, I think, last right. week. And, and I'd mentioned the changes in uh, the rod of nature and, the, and, the, uh, <clears throat> and then change to the Word of Aaron. But in section 101 of the Book of Commandments, and this was in there in, uh, and even in the Doctrine and Covenants till 1863, uh, 1867, I mean, it says, Inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman, but one husband. Hmm. <laughs> this was 19, 1867. Yeah. They've been practicing polygamy since 1844, Joseph Smith probably since 1832. And uh, it's just just amazing that they, they could adhere to that and, and try to proclaim, proclaim to the world that we don't practice polygamy. Is that sort of like lying for the Lord? Or? Kind of, yeah. a little bit, maybe. Okay. Anyway, that finishes that up. Okay. Well, Warren, one thing that struck you pretty diff interestingly was blood atonement. Yes, yes. Tell it is us a biggie for me because, because of Jesus' blood because of his blood and has washed me and cleansed me of my sins. I just, before I get started on some of these quotes, you know, that you remember that primary song, follow the prophet, yeah, he knows oh, yeah. the way. Yeah. You know, I, Mormon prophets don't know the way according to what, uh, you know, <laughs> what the split atonement thing. Hear. Yeah, so let me just share what the word of God says. And this is in John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And, uh, and then we read, what is it? In 1 John 1, 7, um, but if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, I'm just going to, I know we have a lack of time, but there's just a couple of okay, quotes, okay? A couple of quotes. Joseph Smith, Jr. I am opposed to hanging, he says. Even if a man kill another, I will shoot him, or I'll cut off his head, spill his blood on the ground, and let the smoke thereof ascend to God. And if ever I have the privilege of making a law on that subject, I will have it so. So that was Joseph Smith. I mean, you know, blood atonement. You got to yeah. shed your own blood. Jesus' blood is not, yeah. this is, this is really cuts deep in my core. Uh, Brigham Young, he said uh, this in April 16th, 1856. Will you love your brothers and sisters likewise when they have committed a sin that cannot be atoned for without the shedding of their blood? Will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? That is what Jesus Christ meant. And that, you know, you can find that Brigham Young, Desert News, April 16th, 1856. I want to read just a couple of more. Listen to this, Earl. This is good old Brigham again. <laughs> good old Brigham. It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for the sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which the blood of Christ can never remit. Isn't that amazing? I, it, There's a it lack of understanding here. It, I mean... 
If the blood of Christ can't re remit them, your own blood is going to do the job? I, you know, I have three just, pages that I could just keep quoting and, and quoting and quoting. They just don't understand. It, it is But so, it was a doctrine that the church really adhered to, or at least... They still do. They just don't talk about it. Uh, I think they still do. They just don't. It, well, they maybe don't, in high priest group. Yeah, they don't <laughs> believe that murderers uh, are forgiven. No. What's interesting that's about that? Well, they had that, the firing squad here, and in that's Utah. why they judge David, and yet Paul considered himself a murderer, yeah. and Moses, we know, killed an Egyptian, and yet they revere them. And they'll always revert back to the Old Testament as yeah. as the well, they had blood. That's why we have Jesus, friends. Yeah. That's why we have Jesus. And his you know. shed blood. Anyway. Well, the next one I wanted to kind of talk with you about because you're, you have a, an experience, experiences in Christianity. But the next topic is the cross and Gethsemane. Yeah. And one of the things I didn't understand was that when Peter came out of, <clears throat> Peter and Je Jesus are coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane. He, uh, Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus tells him, don't you know that I, I need to do this, that I, that I can't let this cup pass, or whatever the words are that, that, that he said to Peter, which meant to me that what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, yes, was traumatic, and, but it wasn't the actual shedding of blood that was required to, uh, for the atonement. And yet Mormons, and I believe that it was that it occurred in the in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. What about you? Well, you know, did I you to, understand that? Well, yeah, that's what I understood. That it yeah. was the work, the 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 basic Atonement. fundamental work was done in the Garden of yeah. Gethsemane, and that the cross is kind of that's why they, you know they don't have a cross on on their churches. They don't, you know, because which is so funny it's to a me. It's a symbol of death. Yeah, it's a symbol saying. of death, and it's also kind of an alignment. To Christian churches, and w there was one time when when Mormonism, Mormon Church, didn't really want to be affiliated. They they considered them to be, you know, uh, pagan, really, yeah. or heathen. So that's a whole nother. But I go with Paul, you know, and Paul said, "I claim to know nothing." I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, not Him shedding bloods of, you know, tears of blood in, in Gethsemane. Yeah. You know, the cross is essential. It is the core doctrine of who we are as Christians, what he did. Yeah. You know, paying that price, that full price for the sins of the world. And speaking of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, yes. but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Praise How God. Mormons cannot revere the cross <laughs> is just beyond me. Yeah. And yet, it was actually an anathema or some. It was yeah. it was an uncomfortable symbol for me yeah. as a Mormon. It's a torture device. Now, I love it. I, I, just, I, it, I, it, I bring, it brings me emotional tears yeah. most of the time. Well, now one that we could spend the next ten years on: polygamy and polyandry. Ooh, what do you think polygamy of this and polyandry. Let's just start with the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon, 1830 edition. This is, uh, let's see, page 111 in 1830, verses 23 through 24. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, <laughs> yeah. saith the Lord. That was in the first, in 1830 edition. Yeah. Now, in Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, verses 139, we read, Verily thus saith the Lord, You have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein I, the Lord, justified my servants, David and Solomon, as touching the principle and doctrine of having many wives and concubines. David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me. So in the in the you know, the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, it's an abomination. Yeah. In the one thirty two or hundred and thirty second section of the Doctrine and Covenants. He's, oh, I give it I to him. I gave it to him. Yeah, yeah, I gave it to him. So much, conv you know, convoluted, yeah. changing, you yeah. know, all that kind of stuff. And there's no commandment ever given in the Bible to uh, uh, for polygamy. No, absolutely not. And and the one thing, and I want to. There's so much I could say about that, but we'll, you know, uh, the church really acknowledges. Growing up, they, did you hear much about Joseph Smith's practice of polygamy? No, I thought Brigham Young. I knew yeah. there were people sealed to Joseph Smith after he died. That's what I thought. Yeah. But as far as him practicing polygamy, but it's it's pretty well acknowledged now, of course, that he had like, some 30, 34 wives. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and they pretty much in the essays they yeah. even talk about uh, you know. 
him being a polygamist. They right. actually list, I found a list of 35. And here's the kicker. 35 of, the, of those women, from what I understand, 14 of them were already married to another man. Uh, I thought it, it was 11, but... It could be 11. I may be mistaken. I just saw a list one, of four. Yeah, even, even if, if it, it was one. one. And, and, and some of the excuses are, well, he didn't really have sex with them. You know, he didn't have relations. Uh, one of them, and I can't remember her name. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, on her deathbed, she, she revealed to her daughter, you know, you're the daughter of Joseph Smith. Now, DNA testing has later, you know, confirmed that there's no connection there. Oh. But that's not the point. The point is she must have had she, she had relations yeah. or she wouldn't have even been confused about whether or not she yeah. had, you know, that, that daughter her daughter was, was Joseph Smith. Yeah. I mean, that's the point to be made. And it's just, uh, it's mind boggling really to think that he had that many women uh, who were already sealed married. To, already married. Now I wanna, this is so, I know I'm spending too much time on this, but real no, quickly, no, you're fine. real quickly. Uh, <clears throat> you can find this in volume two, page 14 of the Journal of Discourses. This is Jetta Diagram. This blows my mind, Earl. Just friends, just listen to this. Listen to this. This is, uh, like I said, volume two, 14. Did the prophet Joseph want every man's wife he asked for? He did not, but in that thing was the grand thread of the priesthood developed. The grand object in view was to try the people of God, to see what was in them. If a, such a man of God should come to me and say, I want your gold and silver or your wives, I should say, here they are, here they are. I wish I had more to give you. Take all I've got. A man who has got the Spirit of God and the light of eternity in him has no trouble about such matters. Now, I just want to share something. I'm going to, I'm going to share my weakness. If a man of God comes to me and asks me for my wife, um, I'm not going to receive that very uh, well, positively. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm probably going to get in my flesh real quick. Uh, so it, he's going to send you on a mission. He's going to send me on a mission and <laughs> so have can my wife, wife sealed to But the point is, he, say he just did it, you know, this particular lady that I was talking about was one of those polyandrous yeah, marriages. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Say he just did it for some dynastic, like that's what they're claiming now, uh, purpose, you know, to have people sealed into him, right, you know, right. whatever. That's still... That's that's still not right. It's no. still the wrong thing, yeah. you know. And then once Joseph Smith died, some of his wives that he took, like a per perfect example is uh, what is his name, Henry Jacobs' wife. Yeah. Poor old Henry. He stayed a member of the church, you know. I know. Took his wife. She was sealed to Joseph, and then and then she was later sealed to, to Brigham Young. Friends, you know. <laughs> Errol, okay, I, I could go on and on. We'll the just, we'll the just point go. too is is that we don't know this stuff. I mean, we, we aren't Never exposed to that. It. Now, they are in the essays now if people will look them up, but most m members don't read those essays. And uh, in Sacred Loneliness. Yeah. Sacred Loneliness. Oh, yeah. I've got to promote sure. that. In Sacred yeah. Loneliness. Read that book. Yeah. Okay, the next one is, a prof is Our Prophets and Apostles. And this was kind of troubling for me at the beginning because I, I was trying to decide, well, you know, it sounds, uh, I'd always believed that we needed prophets. And I'd never really read Hebrews 1. One, yes. uh, one, one, Very where similar. it says, God, who at sundry time and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. You know, it, it's interesting, too. Um, it sounds like Jesus was, it is finished. It is yeah. done. He was everything. And we have prophets and apostles sitting here. And we have their foundation. Paul said he laid the foundation, or the foundation's laid. Anybody that adds to that foundation, it's another gospel. Absolutely. And one of the other th interesting things is, because uh, I knew that they went through and, and selected Math Matthias, you know, in, in Acts 1. Yes. But it also tells them exactly what the requirements were for an apostle. It said, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, one must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So this was needed to be a person who knew Jesus had resurrected. Paul fit that category because yes. he saw Jesus. So anyway, it just... Um, and, it, and it boils down to the point that, you know, follow a prophet or follow Jesus. We have Jesus to follow. If you follow a prophet, then you're going to be taught some things like, 
polygamy, polyandry, uh, blacks are cursed. Yeah. yeah. All these things they don't really want to talk about so much or, or they try to explain it away. So follow Jesus. He's enough. And what really is interesting is that Mormons now have dismissed, you mentioned the Journal of Discourses. Oh, yeah. They don't even print those now, I don't think. I know that they discounted uh, Miracle of Forgiveness somewhat. Yes, well, they, yeah, they're not they, printing it anymore. You can't really quote Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon doctrine. They, it's like you have to have this living prophet to cover over all the problems that the previous prophets had. And, uh, when were they speaking was, as men and when were they speaking for God, you know? Yeah. It's, it's confusing. Uh, so, you mentioned Adam God. Have we covered that one? That's coming up r right away, isn't it, pretty I soon? I think so, Okay, yeah. I've got something on that. Okay, well, go ahead. But I have what, Lectures Your of Faith? Your next one is, is Lectures of Faith. Lectures on Faith, yes. And this, by the way, yeah. Lectures on Faith were included in the Doctrine and Covenants so all the way up to, eight, what, 1921. 1921. Yeah, now, it's been my understanding and the argument they make is, well, only go with the standard works. We only go with the standard works. Well, the lectures in, of, on faith From 1830 were, to 1921, they were in. They were in yeah. the Doctrine and Covenants, which is canonized, right. which is scripture. Right. Uh, they just decided to take it out. Why? Let's, let's talk about that. Let's read. I'm just going to read this one particular thing that's in there. This is the Lectures on Faith. I think it's uh, Lecture 5. five. Probably, yeah, yeah, Lecture 5. And this is talking about, the, you know, the Godhead. Right. There are two personages who constitute the great matchless governing superpower over all things by whom all things were created and made that are created and made, whether visible or invisible, whether in heaven, on earth, or in the earth, under the earth, or throughout the immense of space. They are the Father and the Son. Listen here, here, here it goes. The Father being a personage of spirit, glory, power, possessing all perfection and fullness. The Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, a personage of tabernacle, made and fashioned like unto man, or being in the form and likeness of man, or rather man was formed after his likeness and in his image. He is also the image and like image, express image and likeness of the personage of the Father, possessing all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father, being begotten, there's no periods here, by the way, good and gracious, begotten of him, and was ordained from before the foundation of the world. But anyway, it sounds very, very, very Christian. Yeah, yeah, very Christian. Yeah. Or however God's you want to put it. God's a spirit and Jesus is in the bosom of the Father. Yes. Yeah. Now, the Holy Ghost, what is the Holy Spirit? And he being the only begotten the Father, full of grace and truth, having overcome, received a fullness of the glory of the Father, possessing the same mind, the same mind with the Father, which, it, which mind is the Holy Spirit. So the mind of God the Father is the Holy Spirit. Totally different than the Mormon doctrine of three people, three, three separate. People, well, just one of infinite amounts of gods and yeah, yeah. all that Joseph Smith That's stuff. That's true. It's yeah. That so it was it, at one time whether they want to admit or not, it's canonized. It's canonized. All right. So the next one is the Adam God theory, um, and this is just fascinating. It says, uh, "This is Brigham Young." Now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body yeah. and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. And it says, how much belief, unbelief exists in the minds of the Latter-day Saints in regard to one particular doctrine which I revealed to them and which God revealed to me, namely, that Adam is our father in God. Now, let me just share with you what Brig with, uh, Spencer W. Kimball said. He said, we warn you against the dissemination of doctrines which are not according to the scriptures and which are alleged to have been taught by some of the general authorities of past generations, for such, for instance, is the Adam God theory. Yeah. We denounce that theory and hope that everyone will be cautioned against this and other kinds of false doctrine. Yeah. So here, these people lived under that umbrella of Brigham Young, knowing that they ha or believing that they had to practice polygamy to get to heaven. That Adam was their God. Yeah. Anyway, just the church is willing that to throw people under the bus any time their their uh, past doesn't uh, quite line up with what they've got. I think there was some Brother Brigham threw on the wall to see if it would stick, and it just never stuck. 
And it becomes just feelings. <laughs> Fist said that that oh well that was trans that wasn't transcribed correctly, which right. is totally dishonest. Yeah, totally dishonest. True. Next one's Adam. Uh, I mean, sorry, Grace and Works. Grace and Works, we or Grace versus write, Works. We could only write a few books oh, about gosh. this. Oh huh? gosh. Let me just share with uh, Second Nephi twenty five twenty three. You know what it says? It is grace. It is grace that we are saved. After all, we can do. What is all we can do, Earl? <laughs> yeah. I, did, do you ever find that out? What 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 is all you can do? And again, it's about what we do. It's yeah, about it's us. about what we can do. And really, it's really about what Jesus did. And the one yeah. that really affected me, and I think it affects so many poor Latter Day Saints who are struggling that don't measure up is DNC 82 7 where it says but unto that soul who sinneth shall the former sins return saith the Lord yes. so if you commit a sin and somehow or another you 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 know you whatever you want to call it the back, backslide whatever yeah. do something bad all, your all that all those sins come right back on you brothers right back on your shoulders and you've got to make restitution you got to you just got to just kick yourself and back beat yourself the, up. Back to the guilt. Yeah, right? back to it. So, you know, we're saved by grace. Yeah. We know. What a wonderful thing to know yeah. that Jesus Jesus paid it all. Yeah. He died. You know, we don't want a license to sin. We, we have liberty to live for Jesus. And John 4, 6, I think it is, or something. He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. life. Again, back to the definition, but everlasting life sounds pretty good. Sounds he great that, to me. He that believeth in me. Yes. And what Jesus did, yeah. not what we do. Exactly. Yeah. By that, the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty yeah. pretty plain. Yeah, that's great. All right, the 1830 Book of Mormon. Oh, this is one of my biggies because this is what really led me out of the church. And I think there's a graphic here showing uh, uh, First Nephi 11, 18. Back in the 1830, it shows that Mary is the mother of God, and it's changed to Mary is the mother of the Son of yeah. God. And then First Nephi 11:21 changed from the Lamb of God, the Eternal Father, to the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father. And 11:32 it says in the 1830 Book of Mormon, the everlasting God was judged of the world, to the Son of the everlasting God was judged of the world. And the last one is in First Nephi 13:40 says the Lamb of God is the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world. And that's changed to the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world. And what's interesting, too, in this 1830 Book of Mormon, I don't know how, I didn't know any of this, but Joseph wrote a letter to Oliver Cowdery back in October of 1829, and he wrote this in a whole big long letter, but part of it says, does not know certain that he can get it, the money, but he's a, he is a going to try. A Use that, try. a going. Well, the 1830 Book of Mormon contains at least nine similar phrases, a journeying, a going, a preaching, a begging, a preparing, a possession, and a coming, and a marching. Yeah. Things that just, it was Joseph Smith's vernacular as opposed, now I know, I know people will excuse that by saying, well, God just, I mean, Joseph Smith used his own words, the King James Version from the 17, 80 whatever uh, family Bible, you know, he just used those. But my understanding was always, I don't know if it was yours, that Joseph Smith translated that little book word for word. Gift he and could, power of God. He could not move from the next word, from one word yeah. to the next word or phrase without it being correct. And they right. said that. Absolutely. And so to use his own English or King James Version English, is just not godlike. I mean, it, it, it couldn't have been God that was giving him that. And if it was translated by the gift and power of God, why over 4,000 changes? Yeah. And I know some of its pronunciation and, yeah. and, and, and Ty stuff like that. But there are stuff. some major phrases. Yeah. yeah. So. Anyway, that, that one really drew me. Yeah. And those changes about God, and then that led me to, well, what, what, what have I missed here? What did Joseph Smith say about God, Jesus, at the beginning? That led me to those lectures of faith, number five. Yeah. And it also led me to the uh, different versions of the first vision. Yeah. And when I got through looking at these three or four things, I thought, he believed in a, in a Christian God. He believed in one God at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the next one is Christians have values. They love their family. And they have programs. Really? Who knew? I, I thought we had that cornered, you know? Yeah. The Mormons, they're the only ones that have good, 
good values. moral families and good values and uh, you know all of that good stuff. But isn't it amazing? It is when you associate with. Have Christians? you seen that with some of the churches you've attended? And stuff? Absolutely wonderful yeah. families and and yeah. with good moral values and, yeah. and teaching. And they it's, love their It's family, not exclusive to Mormonism. Yeah. Uh, I, to be honest with you, there's just as many problems in families within Mormonism as there are in oh, Christian homes. Even I mean, let's so. let's you know, let's be fair and honest. Yeah. Christian Christian families have just as many moral values as as the Mormons want to think they do that they have. So well, that's I, all I'm going to say. Yeah, on that. I mean, we're all human, and that's the point. That's exactly right. Except that Mormons try to act like they're. Well, it's, you they know, do, it's that, do better, do more. You know, that perception of evil yeah. to avoid it, you know, yeah. which I understand that. But, yeah. you know, to perceive or to present yourself as something that you're really not. It's yeah. not, I don't know. Well, good. Anyway. All right. So lying for the Lord. Gosh, this was, this was just fascinating to even get into. Uh, and I guess what it amounts to is telling the whole truth. I have a good friend who's a, uh, an attorney. And he always, he, he contacts me every once in a while. He'll run across things. As he really looks at the law and things that are relating to the New Testament and what Paul taught and, and the law and, and the Old Testament and so on. And what's just so fascinating is he sees these brethren from the our general authorities now not telling the whole truth. They, they say something, but they don't quite tell the whole truth. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that... Um, yeah, we're going to probably run out of time with this. I'll have to come back to this one. Okay. Some things that are, this is uh, uh, Elder Packer. Some things that are true aren't very useful. <laughs> Some think that to be totally honest, they have to tell everything. They don't. Yeah. If they've got the mindset for that, then they're always grumbling. They have an appetite for it. It really isn't productive. It doesn't really make anybody happy. This was Boyd K. Packer in a PBS yeah. transcript. And in the church, we are not neutral. We are one-sided. There is a war going on, and we're in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I've got some more on that, so we'll cover that in a yeah. minute. Doubt your doubts, you know? Yeah, one thing that I... Uh, Even if they're illegitimate. Well, if you're not telling the whole truth, then you're in a fraud mode. Exactly. You know? I mean, if you're lying for the Lord, I think, is the common phrase, but... You, even though you say something, you're not saying everything, then, you, then you're creating a fraud. And that, that wouldn't hold up in court, and that's what this attorney keeps telling me yeah. when he reads things and is exp exposed to some of this. He said, you know, if, if these men were on the stand, they'd be uh, considered fraud. So wow. anyway, we're out of time again on this one. That's I think amazing, we'll do this, finish up a third one. If that's Sounds all right. good to me, brother. We've got a few more things to discuss <laughs> and a whole bunch that we won't even get to. So all right. it's amazing. Anyway, you are following this gospel of Joseph Smith. It's been added to the foundation in the Bible. See you next time.